Um, I think our guest today needs little introduction, needs little introduction, but I'll do a short one anyway. So Mary Portis is one of the UK's most high-profile businesswomen. Her high-flying career includes retail consultancy, working from clients ranging from Louis Vuitton to Mercedes, her own TV series, and leading a government review in, on the future of our high streets. Mayor will discuss her life, how to make it in business, and particularly her new book, Work Like a Woman. So please, can we get a round of applause for Mary? Hello. Hi, Mary, thank you so much for coming. Um, at first, I just wanted to start with, I know, just, just a brief overview of your book. What do you think are the most important points that you make throughout? Well, I think the most important point is that I think when you look at the statistics of where women have reached in business, in, mm -hmm. in, in places of influence and power, it's still pathetically low. Mm -hmm. pathetically low and I really believe and I'm when you read most women who have reached the top mm -hmm. the ones that I look read about in the newspapers that slightly make me go oh not again the ones who get up at 4 30 and you know do their yoga and then have a bit of Mandarin Chinese training with their personal and then they've got seven or eight kids and they run and we all look at these powerful figures look at these women invariably in banking paid a fortune with about five nannies Mm -hmm. uh, what we're putting up on the stage as women who have succeeded are just most frankly unachievable for women. But the big thing, the mm -hmm. big thing I believe is women have had to change the way they are instinctively to fit into a culture that is alpha, that has been created by men for men. So if you have a flower that doesn't grow, you don't say, let's chuck the flower out. This is the way the soil is. You change the soil and you create different conditions. So about five or six years ago, I did that within my agency. I looked mm -hmm. at how I could create a place that empowered women, men as well, because I think alpha culture is limiting. When you have alpha culture that's built on invariably linear power, mm -hmm. you end up with idiots like Trump. That's quite simply it. Mm -hmm. You end up with people like Philip Greens at the top of the Arcadia business, where it's power, linear, and very alpha. And I think most women get to a place where they go, A, I don't want to work like that. Mm -hmm. B, this is bloody exhausting. And C, I have to change intrinsically who I am in order to succeed. So I was very interested when I read your book, there was a, a chapter on changing from the top down. And I was wondering if you think how the messages in your book, and more generally, can be applied from women who are starting at the bottom, who are maybe in low wage employment, say, like, like working, working for working minimum wage, like McDonald's, et cetera, et cetera. How can they change the culture like from below? Well, I think that's a really difficult thing. I mean, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's a, a big ask. I think it's terribly difficult, but there is an answer to an extent. Mm -hmm. What I'm hoping is that the culture of the businesses change in order to empower and make this happen. Because when you start to put pressure mm -hmm. and people are calling out the sort of stuff that's stopping women succeeding, businesses are starting to change. And when I wrote my book, it was interesting, some of the biggest corporations like PricewaterhouseCooper are starting to make this happen. But I think power comes together when people come together and women come together as well. Mm -hmm. So often we think the relationship of work is between me and the boss, me and the company. And I often say to people, pull together, get the sisterhood together, speak with other women, pull together on issues that you don't find accept mm -hmm. access acceptable and go and try and make change happen. Um, it can only start from a ripple. Mm -hmm. The ripple is coming here from me. Other women as well, there's been an awful lot of books this, this year. <laughs> I'd like to think mine was the only one, but it wasn't. But you start to feel that the ripple and the change mm -hmm. is happening. And even something like flexibility, the very sort of structured way that so many businesses work, there's a very there's a lack of flexibility and fluidity. There was a brilliant mm -hmm. book that I read called by um, I can't remember his surname, but his surname was Lalu. I can't remember his first name, and he talked about self government, people coming together mm -hmm. and organising their own rotors and the, the way they work. And often, 
in lowly paid mm -hmm. jobs that you were discussing, that is really quite easy to do. And he showed how people would just say, listen, I, I need to leave at three to pick up the kids. You don't. Can you do my shift on this day? They work it out. They put the same hours in and they come out with a great result because they've been given the freedom to be responsible. Mm -hmm. So the only way that I can make change happen is by showing it, showing it's profitable as well, because that's mostly what the, the only bloody thing that people worry about is gross. You know, how... It, Listen to the Today programme. All they worry about is GD. How have we economically grown? Nobody ever talks about how have we grown in happiness and joy. Mm -hmm. How are people feeling? We don't even look at that, which is just tragic. That was brought into power with Thatcher and the Thatcher years of looking at you know economic mm -hmm. growth is the only way. It ain't. Growth comes out of joy. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this pressure from the bottom requires more formalised structures? Like, do you think the structure of unions we have currently isn't going to work for the kind of change that you want to create? I don't know enough about unions to answer that to you. You're, you're, that. I, I really wouldn't know about, enough about unions and, and how that would work. I don't... I'm What I'm talking about is a cultural shift. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking about... Um, the antithesis to The Apprentice. I'd love to do an, a television show where you know, you look at The Apprentice, you think, I wouldn't employ any of you, you're all knobs, because you're all fighting for who can get to the top, and the mm -hmm. way to do it is you put someone else down, you belittle them, and they let this happen. Mm -hmm. If that is put out there as our, one of our best business shows, along with Dragon's Den, where there's the occasional... Exactly you know, the same atmosphere, yeah. What sort of energy are we putting out that says this, this is acceptable? This is the way that we can work. There is another way, mm -hmm. but we need to show it. And we need to have people like me in the public eye that also talks about it. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, I got to the top because I took on those alpha codes. I did it. You know, I thought, right, I'll fight with them. Mm -hmm. Who wants that? How, that is the most draining way to live your life. But it's a, mm -hmm. And people get burnt out for that. So... The only way that we can do it by making change happen is showing how change can happen. No, absolutely. And on that bit about it absolutely it draining you away to, to live like this, I was interested in your book about how you talked about women toning themselves down. Like one example you gave was, I always wore flat heeled shoes around short male colleagues. No, one particular one egotistical oh, idiot. Okay, okay. Yeah, but it's true. I didn't mm -hmm. always. There are lots of men who are so short and just have know who they are and, ha and don't feel mm -hmm. the least bit threatened. But he was just, he just, uh, he was, was this a sort of implicit bullying that he mm. would do with me? It was a very difficult situation. I was brought in by his boss <laughs> and he was my boss. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, uh uh. And yeah. his boss would often ring directly through to me, which again was doing the same sort of thing to him. Um, but I always used to feel, because I'm five foot nine, I'd put on high heels and I'd suddenly be five foot 11, and he was five foot five, six. And I just thought, oh God, I can't, I don't want to tower over him. I, mm. I, I wanted to diminish myself because he made me feel like mm. I needed to diminish myself. Yeah. Um, and so I kept a little flat pair of shoes in a drawer. What other, what other ways do you think women kind of like diminish themselves around men and work? Because I feel like a lot of this is things that people do unconsciously. Like I'm not sure that people think, ah, I need to, to make myself smaller. It's just something that they that people do without thinking. And I think it's useful to have these ideas in the public mind. Laughing at jokes. <laughs> Brown, they're, they're like, oh, aren't you funny when they're not? Oh, I too feel many, I've got to do men. this. I feel I've got to make you... There's lots of implicit ways that, that mm -hmm. we do this. You know, even I wrote about in my book, I was going on speaking at the Telegraph Business Festival, and I was on after Liam Fox, who I've got about as much regard for as, you know, some chewing gum on the bottom of my shoe. But anyway, I did find myself thinking, this is going to be a real big business talk. Mm -hmm. He'll go on in his grey suit. You know, he'll be talking about the economy. And I looked twice in the mirror and thought, oh, my God, those flowery trousers by Mark Chris have made her a bit full on. Now, I'm 56. I was 56. I was like, what are you doing? You are feeding the animal. You're feeding the animal that says, this isn't a businesswoman. This isn't a person who has a voice that will be taken seriously because she's in a pair of flowery trousers by Mark Chris Almeida and he's in his grey suit by Marks and Spencers. Mm -hmm. So... It does happen. We're always thinking about how we project. And I'm looking at you in your gorgeous blue suit in the front row. <laughs> and it's just gorgeous, right? So it's just you. And the, the, who was it? Amelia was interviewing me before. She said about, well, you know, do you think you dress in a powerful way? You know, in the way, look at your... I said, of course I do. I do dress because I want to feel that. I want to connect with my inner frequency, not mm -hmm. some frequency someone else has set. And if I decide to have a power bob, 
that's my choice, you know? I'm not putting it on because I can be powerful over men. So I think when you feel comfortable with who you are and you're able to express that through your dress, it's not something that's frivolous. It's something that's really quite important. It's a sense of identity. It's a sense of who you are. You know, I've been in the fashion industry for years and it was like, oh, fashion. Like, that's not interesting. Well, actually, it bloody well is. You know, mm -hmm. go walk around the streets nude and see how you feel. <laughs> you know, you do have to have a sense of who you are and, and what you mm -hmm. wear reflects that often. I mean, there's many times you've been in situations where I haven't felt me. And I think often in work, I mean, just look at the city, look at the banking world. See all those women who get off in these sort of sub pinstriped sort of Thomas Absolutely. Pink shirts mm -hmm. and suits. Where you're like, why are you having to dress like men? Why? Because the city's about power and men. No. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time, the burden of change to change these atmospheres it comes on, falls onto women. How do you think men, would, and what do you think men should do to change, this to change this atmosphere and to change this culture? Well, I don't, I think, you know, there are, this is better for men. I think the mm -hmm. men who aren't doing it invariably are the ones who are the problem. It's a very difficult one. I mean, you know, truthfully, let's take what's happened with Philip Green. We're all aware of Philip Green and Arcadia bullying in the business. What I do not understand in there, mm -hmm. where were the people calling him out? Just because he owned that business just because he was the one at the top. What were the women in places of power doing as well? It's not just men keeping quiet here. Mm -hmm. We all have to have a voice. Now, all of his board were men. Oh, big shock there. But where was invariably the human resources department won by women? Were, the, we're not saying unacceptable that we're paying these people off. We have to speak up, it's not just men. And I think that what happens is, if you create a culture that's based on truth, on kindness, people don't put kindness in work. They think kindness is soft. I had to go on Loose Women, let me tell you, that's not a thing you want to do too often. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, please, you know, to my publishers, don't make me go on Loose Women. They go, no, no, please. Anyway, and Janet Street Porter, who's the most anti-female in some ways, she sees me coming and she was like this, <gasps> You were with me. It was frightening, right? We're like, whoa. I thought, this is my PA, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> She's seen it all. So I'm like, oh, my God, this is... And she went for me like, whoa, don't believe all this, you know, hippie sort of nice stuff. I said, I'm not a hippie. She said, well, I was in the newsroom. You had a deadline. You had to get it out. You can't be bloody nice to anyone. You just got to get the bloody down. I said, actually, that's not true. You can be kind. You can be strong. Kindness is rooted in strong strength. Just shouting your mouth off is you showing power. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go deep. So you have to show this stuff. And men want to work like this. Most men want to work like this. But they feel they have to play the game. Look at it. One of the things that we were looking at in my uh, agency is, is maternity and paternity leave. Mm. When I was doing the research for my book, some of the best paternity leave is in the banks. Would you like they will give men six months off to paternity leave? My MD is a woman, mm -hmm. her husband's in the banks. When she had her second child, he took the six months off. He was the only man Did that year that took it off. Now, if you've got a culture that means everybody's got to get in the office by 7 a.m., you work weekends, you're on call at this time, that is not saying. Hmm, family's important. You have a life outside this. So you create that culture. No guy's going to go, bye, I'm off. And we spoke to so many men that used to say whenever they did leave early, going, oh, going home to help the wife. The subtle currents, the, the jabs, slight bullying, yeah. the jabs. So the culture change needs to come mm. from the top. Or a group of them going, we don't want this anymore. So it's, it's, would you say, small action, just like calling out this behavior. If someone in the office makes a joke about a man going home to help his wife, it's all of our responsibility to take it. Yes, and the people who are also listening comes. to it, mm. this, which is what I was talking about. To the people, where were the people around saying, this isn't going to mm. work? Well, they're all in a fear factor place. They're all in a place of fear. Mm -hmm. And facing their fear is, what well, place of fear is the, the biggest thing we all have to do. But we have to pull together in this. And I think the more that we do, and I... I do think the time is now. And sadly, it's because of things like the Me Too movement, the gender pay gap. Mm -hmm. But there is a fearing of the goddess. I feel this energy that is coming, this female energy, that will mm -hmm. be a good, powerful energy. 
but it has to be all of us feeling part of it and not mm -hmm. feeling that fear. Because when you f step outside that and push for what is right, for what is right, mm -hmm. change can only start to happen there. Can you outline a bit more of what you mean by this like female, en female energy? Um, and why, if you think if it is essentially feminine, and how it could, this something that seems so gendered can then be applied to, to men? Well, I think quite simply, most of the culture and the way that we have lived from politics, things that affect the way we live. Look, we only have to go back to what the church and the power in the church, total male power, total male power. That goes into politics, that goes into decision making, that goes into how our life is lived. And unless we are at those places of power, women are not going to have an expression. Women are not going to have a say. And most of those institutions are built around an alpha power, as I've explained. So what's the, op the alternative one? The, the warm, fuzzy, soft power that's actually brought children into the world, built families, takes on the social and emotional load of those families. Mm -hmm takes on critical things that makes the world go round, that is invariably seen as a female power. So how about we put those into those institutions and let's see what happens. And that's what I've done mm -hmm. in my business. That's what people at Price Waterhouse are starting to do. L L Jaguar Land Rover have started to do it. Places where they're seeing, if you just create a place of like-minded, historical ways of working, you are not going, going to, to grow. Succeed. You are not, well, some do succeed. Mm. Profit is success in some eyes. But what does it do, do for the world? What does it do for the way society is? What mm -hmm. does it do for the next generation? We are seeing it. We are stressed out. We have to have mm -hmm. the highest levels of depression. Number one illness. This isn't joy. So I like the idea of making money and being a bit kind, a bit fun, and enjoying my life and seeing the people around me in my business doing so the same. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to your work with the high street and work with shops, um, how do you think we can implement this into, into reviving the high street? You talked about making coffee shops with like childcare attached. Like, how do you think we can integrate the high street back into our communities? That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. When I did the high street report, they said to me, have you met with Philip Green? I said, Christ, you know, this is what it's come to, you know. This isn't, what, this isn't about commercial gain. This isn't about a quick, how can we build a business where we have clever systems, where we actually make, you know, quick profits at the, you know, the effect of other people. Mm -hmm. The high streets was about communities. And when I did it in 2011, I'm telling you, they thought I'd lost my marbles. It, the high street, you have to understand human needs. And there was a brilliant book written in the 60s by Jane Jacobs called The Death of the American City. Mm -hmm. She was an extraordinary woman. And she got laughed at by the town planners, by all the architects, because she talked about the trivial small things that make up the social infrastructure of our life, like popping out to get a loaf of bread, saying hello to someone while you do it, bumping into a neighbor and saying, can your daughter babysit tonight? seeing your, your neighbor's kids having a fag down there and going, boys, you shouldn't be smoking, you know, while you're getting a newspaper. She said, these sound like trivial, but the sum aren't trivial at all. They are a web of social security and infrastructure mm. on how we want to live. Now, fast forward, we have the internet, the biggest revolution since the Industrial Revolution. It, it's getting faster and faster. I read somewhere that, that in, I think it was, I can't remember, when the, uh, the digital world was first, um, when the first computer was designed, at the same time as the Italian car, the fastest car at that time, I think went something like 120 miles an hour. And if that car had, cre in 1957, I think it was, if that car had gone at the speed of what the, 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 um, internet or you know the technical and digital world that card will be seven times the speed of light so we've gone into a, a world where like ooh, oh, 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 oh. if you listen to the newspapers all they write is the the high street is dead the high street's not dead the the understanding from local and central politicians is about as creative 
as I'm trying to look around this room, there's more creativity in this room, even on bare walls than that. Mm. They looked at what you could do and how we were looking at a commercial vehicle. Mm -hmm. The high street's not dead, you just have to look at the way we're living and changing. So, here's the thing. You get businesses like Marks and Spencer's going, oh, nobody's coming anymore. Mm -hmm. You didn't change your business model. You've got pure players who started on online who have come up with ideas and redefined the way we buy because they're understanding how we're living as humans today. Imagine if Marks and Spencer said, okay, we know we're buying less fashion stuff, which we are. I'm going to take one floor and we're going to make it into an office for young startups. 30 people. Take that. Just a, all you need is the size of this area here. These, these are stores that are all over space because we're mm -hmm. buying less stuff yep. physically. Oh, you know, when they come in, they're going to need a coffee. So we'll have a coffee retailer over there. And then it's lunchtime, they'll need food. So we'll do a deal with some lovely local independent street food retailers. They can be in there. Oh, and while they're doing that, we'll put a gym in because mm -hmm. well-being's grown hugely. Everybody's working out. Now. Beauties, why are they not looking at the way they live? Now, we are not going to need as many fashion retailers. That is shrinking. Mm -hmm. But we are wanting to connect. We are wanting experiences. We are spending our money on food, on well-being, on health, on beauty. All mm -hmm. that's growing. And none of those guys that were running these big businesses saw this coming. And here's the other thing. The pure players are opening up bricks and mortar stores because the most important way for them to connect with their brand is physically because we're neurobiologically wired as humans to connect. And the things that we remember more are physical experiences and digital ones. And not only that, commercially, if someone goes into a store, they are 68% more likely to buy a second item when they're in a physical store than they are online. So it all adds up. I was talking earlier on to, to, to one of your team doing an interview. Like, I would love to have taken one of the empty stores, especially a British Home mm -hmm. Stores one. I mean, that's another thing. When they go to these stores, empty. did anyone say, oh, gosh, I so miss British Home Stores. Weren't they so fabulous? No. no. Mediocrity is what's gone from our high street. And as Warren Buffett says, when the tide goes out, you can see who's swimming naked. Mm -hmm. The tide went out and all the little mediocres are going out there naked. And the really good players, I think we'll have a more exciting high street of the future. Where it needs to change is where local councils are thinking about communities in far-flung parts of the northern cities who none of those retailers want to go to and they need to be putting libraries, creches, places that connect and help those communities. And when you put a library there or you put a creche to these women who are mothers that can get together, what will happen? They want a coffee, we'll open up a coffee bar. Oh, actually, I, I, I'll drop my kids off, we'll open up a little nursery, chat together. We could recycle books while we're doing that. We could have second-hand shops. They're not thinking yeah. about community. humans and community. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'd have loved to do is opened up in Sweden, the empty mouths. I don't even love the Swedes. Why do we always say the Swedes and we're never up there? They're so bloody great. Mm -hmm. In Sweden, the empty mouths has been so many because people have shifted. Uh, this woman's just opened up a completely recycled, upcycled charity mouth. How fabulous is that? So everything in there is secondhand and it's packed. I, I, I've put out a call to do this a hundred times. I, about three years I've been on about this and she's done it in Sweden. I'm like, because <laughs> I opened up my charity shops. I have 26 charity shops and they're the most profitable charity shops in the country. Charity shops were seen as the things that were the dirge mm. of the high street. Well, let's not do them anymore. in a different way. Let's do them in a different way. Let's not them look, have them just stuck there looking like they're down at mm -hmm. heel where people don't want to go and they dump stuff on the doorsteps. Let's change them. Let's make them beautiful places. Let's talk about upcycling. Let's get communities to donate their time. Let's get people to donate their goods and actually make each community connect with each other and see who can get make the most money. Then you get a competition going. <laughs> There's other ways of making it work. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it just lacks imagination. That's the problem with See, the high street. My next question I was going to ask is whether you think the death of the high street is caused by, by the domination of big chains and the lack of local businesses. But you seem to be outlining that you think these can all work together in a kind of more fused ecosystem of, of shops. Well, where the big chains have... Like, I think Waterstones did a very good uh, job. On the, the, it's not the death of big chains. If you've got big chains, they have to shift and Waterstones mm -hmm. everybody it was interesting on the book 
business because everybody thought the books were over. The Kindle got invented. That was the death of books. And what was clever? And Amazon came in the market, like just hoovered it yeah. up, hoovered it up. What was clever? They were one of the first that got knocked was the, the book industry. Mm -hmm. So the publishers worked with the retailers. And the publishers created these limited edition. They made their books more beautiful, they're richer. Look at some of the children's books that you see now. It's extraordinary how much effort they put in effort into it. They then worked with the retailers on getting authors in to do talks, to having evenings. They put cafes into them. And they've created these places where people want to be. And buying a book is a joy. So they actually did a very good job on it. The retail chains, they dominated. And then when, the, when it hit and the internet came, and in the early 90s, they were all scrabbling about so many internet brands to try and make it work. But once it hit, you just saw all those retailers like, what the hell's happened? And so we have got less, as I say, of these retail chains that did, aren't delivering what we want. I, if I was a counsellor, would be saying, OK, what's the new shape of businesses tomorrow? And I'd be doing peppercorn rents for them like they do for, do you know what I mean by that? No. Well, basically, what used to happen, if a mall's building a mall, or a high street is mm -hmm. owned, and it's, a lot of councils don't own the properties, but say they do, they want, in the old days, they'd say, if I put Marks and Spencers on the high street, it's going to deliver footfall. Or if I put Marks and Spencers or Debenhams at that end of the mall, that's going to deliver footfall, I'm going to pay, charge them a peppercorn rent, which is basically nothing for the first year, 18 months. They go in and say, yeah, we'll come in. They just opened the doors and start making money. I did it when I launched Harvey Nicks in Leeds. Mm -hmm. They gave me peppercorn rent. I mean, I didn't think we were going to make money. I, opened, I remember standing in the store and looking across the road and seeing Dixon's opposite us and thinking, oh, my God, I've done something terribly <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Harvey Nichols was never next to a Dixon's. <laughs> um, but they gave us peppercorn rent. Mm -hmm. And so all the businesses started to come because they knew Harvey Nichols was there. We were getting the footfall, so they all come in. So why aren't councils going, OK? I, I spoke to... Um, Miliband on this. I bumped into him because everybody thought I did it for the Tory party. I said, I, the mistake I made, I should have done a cross party. And I said to him, all the worst affected towns are Labour ones. Why aren't you doing something with the councils mm -hmm. where you just do this deal and you speak to the local markets and say, what would you need on your high street? Don't let, in the old days, the change just came in. It was whoever could pay the best rent. Nope. That's gone. So what do you need? What would make you want to come back to the high street? Working with the communities to understand that. Then doing a peppercorn rent for that business. And you just start to organically build a place and a space where people want to be. How do you think the growth of like very small local businesses that might be unique to one community, do you think, one, do you think that's good? And if you do think it's good, how do you think we can foster that in this era where people are getting, getting priced out? Priced out of what? Priced out of rent, priced out of... Doing well, they're getting priced out, and there's the, the landlords are sitting mm -hmm. there going, well, I either start doing a deal because this ain't coming. And, you know, they're, 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 they're as slow as the retailers were. And getting priced out, well, uh, nobody's coming, so we better start thinking of something. And interestingly, the best is when they're starting to sell them back to the council, and I think the council's owning those properties actually makes for a much better business model because then you can actually create the high street that's fit for purpose. You can have a Berkeley. vision. Yeah, you can have a vision. That's where you see some of the best. I don't know if anyone's ever been to Marlebone High Street. It was owned by a company that whole real estate. I remember they did a deal with Terence Conran to open Conran shop at the top, Peppercorn Rent. Mm -hmm. Can't remember who they put at the other end. And they had this vision. They wanted Waitrose to be the only store. I mean, like they obviously understood this was Marlebone. You know, I'm not going to just put a little in the middle. Little in the middle. There mm. we are. Um, so they created it, and it's buzzing, but we, d we can't have that just where there's money. We need to be doing that where there are communities who were absolutely left out in the cold when the people like Tesco's were just built on the edge of town. I, I remember going to Margate um, to work on looking at the re... Um, generation of that that was just a really tough experience and I remember turning mm -hmm. up you know going into the car park and there's all these drug addicts and there it was a town where they just shifted people mm -hmm. you know it was just you know the energy you could feel it. it was just pain in this place but one of the great things is the Turner exhibition opened up there and you could feel that this and I thought it was a really great thing they did and you could feel what was happening though all the money people getting the train up they were like passing by the Margate that was 
down at heel and going to the turner. But you could already start to feel there was an opportunity to do that. So I started working with them on the town on how we could work from this magnet, mm -hmm. start to open up coffee shops where all the people from Turner exhibition, then start to get unique boutiques and little different kind of kooky shops there, and then start to go into the less, you know, chargeable, m more expensive, but you're actually starting to create this high low. At that time, Tesco's wanted to open an 80,000 square um, shop on the edge of town. Now, I am in the middle of doing my government report. Mm -hmm. I am reporting through to Eric Pickles, who was the community secretary. I remember the town people going, they can't sign this off. They can't. I mean, this obviously went against everything that I was trying to do. And they signed off that Tesco's open. I wrote to him personally. Mm -hmm. And they still signed it off. And you know what happened there? What's been interesting, and this is another opportunity for high streets, is when the crash happened, the mm -hmm. financial crash, and subsequently this shift in the way we were spending, it took a couple of years, people have stopped going and driving out of town to do a big shop, loading up their car, where they find out, A, the petrol prices are expensive, yep. B, they chuck about a third of their veg and fruit stuff they buy. So they stopped doing this. They started to buy deliveries online that were just big stuff they didn't want to go out and buy, you know, that was just... But now, on average, local supermarkets, people visit them 21 times in a month. So we're buying, we're going more often, but buying little. Now, who'd have thought that change was going to happen? So that was a cultural change that happened. Mm -hmm. And now all the supermarkets are scrabbling to get back on the high street and they're left with all these big out-of-town um, stores. It no shifted visiting. that is costing money. And guess which one was left? The Margate one. In the end. Am I sounding a bit cynical? I really don't mean <laughs> to. I really don't, because I do believe there's hope, because I do believe there's mm. vision, and I think there's great people in the world. I don't mean it to be, but sometimes, you know, shift changes just mm. from the people. Change, and that's why you have to understand where they are and what they're doing mm -hmm. um, in order to make change to business. One thing I found really interesting uh, when I was reading reading up for this interview was how the literal architecture of cities is 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 built in a way that disadvantages women. So there's no ramps that you can put prams up, so people people can't. Why is it only physically. the women pushing the buggy? See, because well, it is see, cultural <laughs> expectations. <laughs> yeah, oh. and I was wondering like how you think an integrated approach can be taken to literally re reworking our local communities so people people can connect. I think that's really important. I think one of the things when I was doing the High Street report, mm -hmm. I didn't even believe, it wasn't even part of the national planning framework. It so was seen as something that took care of itself, you yeah. know? It was sort of like, Just you know, happens. it washed its own face. It happened, you know, the steps get silos. Mm. It was, you know, we don't worry about that. That's owned by a landlord. The landlord mm -hmm. doesn't deal with the retailer. And that's all shifted. So it wasn't even part. And again, you should read Jane Jacobs because she talks about that. Putting places where you just breathe. Little mm -hmm. parks, little spaces of green. Mm -hmm. Understanding if you put those into those physical spaces, people hang, people go. I mean, one of the, the most important things that we've seen change is when everyone talks about experience, experience. Mm -hmm. You know, have you seen markets, how busy they are? Like, they are rammed because people just want just a little bit of discovery, turn up on a Saturday morning. You know, most are more expensive than going to the supermarket, but people want to be in the places where there's a hub, where there's an energy. And so much of retail in the future will be about the activity and the byproduct we'll be buying. So it's, it's now more it's about the shifted. experience than the physical yeah. products. Well, yeah. Why? Why? It's why would they come to us? So when you look at great businesses, um, you know, even when I rebranded Harvey Nichols, I rebranded it around stuff that made people want to turn up. It wasn't what we sold. Mm -hmm. Harrods down the road had a much better selection. They had a much more powerful buy. They were able to go in and say, what designers have they bought? We'll triple the buy. But I did stuff that made people want to come. You know, I put an art supermarket on the fifth floor where it was just art, all for 500 pounds, in trolleys, un 500 pounds and, and, and under. We used to get rammed. We'd put a bar, no one had put a bar in a department store. Most department stores is where you went and had a milkshake and a bun. No one had put an actual bar that was a social meeting place in there with the latest jazz bands playing. People came for that. Oh, well, pop by, I'll buy some beauty while I'm in here. You know, oh my God, I must get, you know, a t-shirt for a friend's present or whatever. 
you created places and spaces where people harmoniously wanted to be. And that is the role of our high streets. That's the role of the community. That should be the role of national planning. It's bigger than a siloed relationship mm -hmm. between a landlord and a retailer. Fantastic. And do you think that, and if, if this is possible, how high street chains and local business can work with each other to really make this kind of integrated vision possible? Because it seems like it's all about fitting into the community, but I think that's, that sounds like quite a difficult thing to do if brands never, or different pe people never communicate with each other. Well, I think you're seeing think. a lot more of that now. I think in, you know, there are now bodies that within each towns where mm -hmm. all the retailers connect together, business districts are called bids. Um, they're, uh, they're starting to do this a lot more because they're having to. And you know you can feel the towns when you go there. You just know that that's happening. I mean, you have a pretty good one here. I mean, I, I was here doing a talk. I can't remember why I was just last here doing a talk. Um, and I just remember coming out on the Saturday morning and just like it was really buzzing. I mean, obviously, you've got the university. You've got people who are coming, new tourists. So, it, you know, there's a reason. Mm. That's the why. That's, that's the, why. the why. And the byproduct is, oh, well, we're here. We'll pop off. We'll have a bite of lunch or we'll stop off at this store. But... I think we're seeing a much, much more open and co 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 collaborative mm -hmm. approach to the way that this is not just about you as a business. Um, and I think a lot of that I put into my report where I said about town teams working together where people who are the stakeholders of the town. This isn't just about council and retail. This is about the people who live there too becoming part mm -hmm. of that. But on collaboration, I think one of the biggest problems facing women in the workplace is the expectation that there can only be one woman, one woman at the top and women always have to compete with each other specifically. Um, I was wondering how you think people can try and break down that attitude of, you know, I have to be the best woman in the room. Because is I think that it's so? Very, yeah. I, think I, think I don't know about one woman at the top. What do you mean by that? So I, I think in attitudes, where, in environments where there are lots of men, there's an expectation that there'll only be a couple of a couple of women. And it's not women an expectation; to, yeah. it's just a truth. And then a reality as well. <laughs> it just happens. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I genuinely don't think it's an expectation. And mm -hmm. I also, what's interestingly, when I talk to so many men about it, they don't. They just. It's an acceptance. It's a sort of blind acceptance of the status quo, of the way it is. You know, and and so many years. Mm -hmm. We've all, it's only until someone calls it out. And that's why, call, look at the feminist movement. It's only until someone calls it out and goes, ah, hang on a minute. You go, oh, yeah. You know, there's so much more. I mean, that's why we're looking at stuff here happening on the Me Too. This has been going on for hundreds, hundreds of, of years. years. And someone calling it out, stand up there and say, oh, God, yeah, what the hell? Why do we let this happen to us? I mean, it's... I don't. I, I think women can be very competitive with other women yeah. as well, and I think that's something you know that one has to be aware of. But I think, I think we can be tough on ourselves. I think men can be competitive with other men. You know, I think that's nature. I think that's nature, and I just think that's why I talk about kindness. You know, it has so much more power in that. Being kind. And I think we are moving into. Everyone gets. You're in a time where we're so much more aware of this. And we think about, we're thinking more about the world. I th I th there's a real polarization at the moment where we're thinking about how we live, where with sustainability, where, where you know, women's rights, where the, the Me Too movement, the gender, all of this, you can just feel this change happening. And then at the other end, you have the Trumps, and it's extraordinary. And I, somehow, you feel that this is an aging power oh. that's going, mm. but this needs to really yeah. push. And it's there. And it's down to you guys to make that happen. It really, really is. I mean, you know, the, my generation, we fucked up so much. <laughs> you know, we really did, but, you know, at least we can just try and make it happen mm. and be a voice. But it's also down to you all to make that happen. And calling out the sisterhood when they're being, you know, rough on you. It's really funny the other day. I, I was bullied by a woman at Topshop. And no, I really wasn't. She, just, she, was, she was the marketing director, and mm -hmm. I was that like, little sort of greenhorn, you know, know all going around. And fast forward like 30 years, yeah, 30, and I go into the Palladium for my little son this Christmas. She was there. I was like, hey, she said. And I was like, it's still the pain was there. She, I don't mm. think she even remembers. That's who you are. That, and I, so, I, I should have gone, do you know you really believe? I didn't because I wasn't going to start that in front of the family. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past me. But, um, but I just think, you know, those things happen along the way and it, you, you, they stay with you, that pain. And I think you have to remember that. And just remember, I'm not going to pass that on. Yeah, absolutely. And lastly, you're a young woman. You've just got into business. 
you want to make it to the, you want to make it to the top of this company, you want to do well, and you've got a really really difficult male boss or male coworker. What would be your top three tips for this lady? Well, I'm going to answer that tangentially. I'm mm -hmm. going to say it could be a male or a female. Sure. Uh, because I think dealing with that, and I, I've often had, I've, had, I've just been going through this with my daughter. Actually, funny enough, I'm like, whoa. How old know, is she? she? She's 23. Mm -hmm. She just got out of Oxford, and she's gone into work, and she's had someone do this to her, and she's like, oh my god, I've just got to keep my head. I was like, you know what? You don't. So I think, and you have to, have, you have to have the confidence because the worst thing that you have to face a fear and go. This is really making me feel unhappy. Mm -hmm. So I've got two options here. I just continue to be unhappy yeah, for the sake of keeping my job or I call this out. And I think the most important thing is saying, and I always say it to, to any of my team and we do it to anybody I'm advising. I did a piece in the column on, this, on Sunday Times on this is, you just say to that person, can I, can I speak with you? It's tough, but you have to Tell say it. Quite word. And you, you just say, can I speak with you about my, my work? I'm finding that you're not happy with the way I'm working. Um, you, and there's little implicit things often they do. They, they don't involve you in an email that's yeah. come around, or you're not called into the meeting. Just say, I noticed that you didn't do this, and it's making me feel uncomfortable. Am I right to feel uncomfortable? Now, you've called that out straight away. You've not been aggressive. Am I, should I be worried about something? Ball is in their court in their court and also also then if something's not done about it she has to write back to you or connect back to you and if it's not mm -hmm. you go back in again and if it continues then you have to go to a high level you just have to do it mm -hmm. now I'm not sure I was able to do it I wasn't it took me 30 odd years to bump into her at the plate and not say you bullied me <laughs> but there are ways of doing this and there's been even better well m many books that talk about this and I just think that's the most interesting thing is you have a voice, you have a right. And, you know, I was saying to, you know, um, Amelia was, who interviewed me earlier that I have a situation where everybody from the intern in has to have a voice in our business. Mm -hmm. And even though it might be scary having to sit around a table with me, we sit around and it's a round table so everybody feels equal, which is a really important thing because there's always a hierarchy mm -hmm. around table positions as well. And... Um, you're there, I say to everyone, for a reason. You're here. You've been employed here because we need you just as much as you, you want to us. be here or you need us. And I think that, that to me, is the most important thing. Feel that you have a voice and use it. And it's extraordinary. You're all super educated and super. My daughter just finished Oxford and she was the same. She's like, Mama, I thought, <laughs> what? Stop it. Come on. You're my daughter. <laughs> but it is. You just, your sense of self, you know, and people can make anybody feel. It's the easiest thing to do is to make someone feel bad about feel themselves. It's yeah. easy. It's lazy. And it's just, it's no power in that. And so it does call them out. Anything. Call, call them, them out. out. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I think we'll open it up to the floor now. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Um, just put your hand up if you do. Oh, um, at the, in the middle there? In the white, yeah. Oh. Um, you were talking about creativity and the need for compassion in a business. Do you think that's what's lacking in businesses at the moment to enable them to develop the high streets? Well, that's a big one. That's gone like that. I think I think compassion is a really important part of business, you know. And I think we have to realise that business is about a human energy coming together, working together. Th that's it's effectively all it is. Now you can have your goals and you can have your purpose, which is really important because otherwise you'd all be like floating around like a bunch of hippies. Have your goals and your purpose, but the real energy comes from people together. I've had people in my business, and I, I, I look back on myself and I'm like, oh my God, did I really do this, you know? But I've had people where, they, you know, they've not been performing. And they're, oh, they've got, I have this thing, we, we try and employ radiators, not drains, because drains can be like, oh, whatever you do, they'll still moan on. And you know, when you're busy and you've got a big, you're trying to like, oh, come on, what's the matter with that person? Oh, they haven't performed. Well, you have to go deeper. You ha it's the plant analogy that I gave you before. I've got one of the best. It, this, we have this guy in our business, and, and he was suffering from depression. I didn't know. I didn't know. And we had to go deeper to find that compassion that said, OK, didn't know this was happening. Now, most businesses don't do that, so you miss. 
he is probably one of the best people I have in my business today, just because we took the time. Now, instinctively, my early days, there was a couple of months I was going, like, what is the matter with such and such? But you do have to put compassion in and you do have to take the time. And you do have to, we have a responsibility in business to do that. Now, how that links to the high street compassion is quite simply, how do we want to live? How do we want to live? And what sort of society do we want for us that gives and feeds our souls? That's the question. That's the question that government should be asking. And I know that Cameron came out with his big society. I'm not sure that worked. I think that was a kind of nice PR platform. But truly, we should be looking at how we want to live. And I think compassion is at the heart of that. Because if we don't bring joy into the way that we live, we have huge issues. The, the, the biggest crime rates are often in places where people and young kids have got nowhere to go, hang on the streets, no sense of self. What, 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 what hope is that when you've got businesses making huge amounts of money? What's that doing for our country? So I think compassion is absolutely central. Fantastic. Do we have one, one at the side there? Um, you mentioned taking a kinder approach. Um, what challenges have you faced when trying to take that kind of approach? And along the way, was it often mistaken for a weakness? Um, is it mistaken for a weakness? Um, I tell you what, sometimes it's easier not to take that approach, if I'm honest, you know? Sometimes you want to go, right, okay, I am the boss, we're doing this, for God's sake, we've got a deadline here, you know? Um, but no, I don't think it is. I, d I really don't think it's been seen as a weakness. Um, and you know what? The minute I was able to not play the role that I thought I needed to play and that I did connect in with, is this good and is this right and is this kind what I'm doing? It was the most freeing thing I could do. And um, well, Janet Street Porter didn't think it was a strength, <laughs> let's put it that way. But then I'd rather be doing what I'm doing than being on Loose Women. <laughs> Very bad. At the front here? Yeah, it's just um, sort of building on this idea of kindness. And you're talking about kindness um, from the point of a, of a very successful business owner. Um, what kind of message would you want to send Yeah, 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 yeah. To appease everybody, to, you know, yeah. to, to not ruffle feathers. And while you're doing that, putting your head down and you're doing a great job and being great at what you do, all the men... Oh, don't, I know. We were just talking. ...understanding the rules of the game. Mm. And, you know, bollocks to kindness. Mm. They're getting on with it. Mm. Well, and also how do you bring on other women? Yeah. Well, okay. So the, the kindness that I'm talking about is rooted in strength. And I use the word courage rather than bravery. You know, courage is from the Latin word core, which is strength, rather than, oh, let's risk taking bravery. And I think that's a really important thing. I've never got the cakes in, and nor will I. I've never gone and got the office ready to sell, and nor will I. But I will if it's done with other people in the business and it's a part of my role that's seen as being supportive as a team. Or if it was part of my job. So I think the role we have, you know, I have a, a female PA, but I would just as much have Eden or the guys that will be going out, sorting out lunches, because we have created that culture to do that. Although it does annoy the tits of me. When it comes to Christmas, it does end up with the women choosing the, the gifts for the clients. And you're like, why aren't the guys doing that? This is really annoying. So I don't see... What you're picking up is, is that the roles of those, the carer, the one making everyone happy, sorting out the birthday card, remembering that, has invariably been left on the shoulders of the women. And that is 
not what I'm talking about, but I do know that that happens. You're not saying it doesn't, it bloody well does. I'm talking about kindness in making decisions. I think kindness can also be telling someone, do you know what, sorry looking you in the face, it's not working for us and I don't think it's working for you, this job. I think that's being kind in business as opposed to I'm going to take you through the formal process which you know at the end this is not going to go somewhere or making that person feel demeaned and just ignoring them because you know what, we've got a big, bigger job to get on and just let, let's do that. So that's what I mean by kindness. What you're mixing up is that female caring role which we pick up and I just think we have to be very mindful of that. You know, it is, it's the mental load as well. It's remembering the nephew's birthday card because the old man's forgotten to do it, you know, mm. and so forth. And I just think we have to call out, and it's really painful sometimes because you just, on the end, I'll just do it myself, you know, and I understand that. But the kindness I'm talking about is an honesty, a truth, and an ability to guide people in business. We're in the right direction, and it might be a direction that says, this ain't working. Fantastic, thank Hello, you. Hello, there's a girl there. Did you want... Um, I was visiting my dad's office the other day and I was watching, walking down Bishopsgate Street and I'd been the only female on the carriage I was in on the Waterloo and City Line mm. and I've never felt more out of place in my life. Mm. Like, I was wearing my massive high-heeled boots so I'd be the same height as the men because I knew it was going to be a male-dominated environment. And obviously that's an environment that I want to go into when I graduate because that sort of high pressure job appeals to me. But how would you recommend like dealing with imposter syndrome where you feel like this isn't a place for you, where you feel like, like you're the odd one out because you're the only female on, on your tube carriage? Well, you know, sometimes I, well, I, I'm sure there is an imposter syndrome, but you're going to put yourself into it by the sounds of it. I don't think you're going to be too impostery. So I think the other thing is, is, it, is, is that also recognising that you're going into, uh, you know, a place that is... I mean, I, I, I went into retail. You'd think it was going to be a women. It wasn't. But I kind of knew that I was going into this male-dominated area. But you have to have a sense of yourself. Just know that you are, are... Call it out, number one, because I would be speaking when you're going for your interviews and saying, how many women are on the board? What percentage of women have you had? You need to ask those questions before you even go into that place. Because if you just accept and you say, well, I'm going to wear my high heels so that I'm at the same height of these guys, unlike me in my flats you are going to just swim into that culture that they've got and not make change happen. So when you go for your interviews, you've got every right to be asking, is this the kind of place where I'm going to grow? Is this, even if I'm a minority, it doesn't matter, are they going to respect me? How, what percentage of women on your board? What's your turnover when it comes to women? What happens, what percentage of women leave once they've had a child? What percentage of men take paternity leave? Ask those questions that are a real issue for you and also speak to them about what you need to wear for work. Well, is, there a, is there a dress that they say, oh yes, it's got to be a suit, and you're going to say, okay, you start questioning it. You have the power to do that. Why would they not want to employ you? They will want to employ you. Most businesses want to employ bright, sassy people. They really do. They really, really do. What does invariably happen, though, is when you get to the top is that promotion is done. If there's a man in there who's sort of white, middle-aged, he invariably feels more comfortable with another white, middle-aged man. And you just get those biases that just mm -hmm. happen. They do, you know. And the woman who walks in in the pointed shoes with the whatever suddenly is not... This doesn't feel comfortable. So you need to ask how comfortable they feel. Ask those questions. I'd love someone coming into an interview for me asking that. I think, good on you. We limit ourselves far too early on. I didn't have anywhere near the confidence that you guys all have. Christ, you're here. Fantastic. Any, any other questions? Oh, at the back there. Fantastic. Um, what um, impact do you think this sort of transformative business culture, which like, empowers women that you were talking about at the start, will have on um, like how transformative will it be for the domestic Darling, women? could you just repeat that again? I really, I'm trying my best to hear you. I'll say it again. Sorry. Um, so the transformative business culture for, that empowers women that you're talking about at the start, how, um, what, what impact will it have on women's lives at home? Will they still be made to feel guilty for going back, for like leaving their kids at home, for buying an, a nanny and stuff like that, um, which men, like successful men, never feel guilty for because of the different expectations? 
Well, it's an interesting one. You're saying, will they still feel guilty? I think, you know, the guilt that women have, it's, we, you know, thousands of years of that, I'm not sure we're going to be able to override. But I think we should be able to, and this is what I was talking about earlier on, if we show women who are doing this and are feeling complete, and women talk about the issues over children and handing them over to nannies and so forth, then we start to eradicate some of those feelings and we push businesses to push for paternity leave more. I never felt guilty leaving my children because I always made the certain time that I needed to be there for them. I was very clear on what good looked like in terms of my children's time that I had with them. Um, and I remember there were things that I just used to say to myself, I've got to let that one go because the greater good of what I'm doing for them, which I was the, the major breadwinner, will be better than me being the one at the school gates at 3.15, which quite honestly would have bored the tits off me. So do I do this because I think this is what I need to do? And I remember so vividly, Milo was seven and I was emptying his little school bag and there was a, an invitation for a, a supper at Jonathan's Bistro with all the other mothers. And I said, oh, Milo, why didn't you give this to me? And he said, as if you'd want to go, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> and I, he clicked, what, you know, and to this day, you know, he's 25, Verity's 23, and I've got a six-year-old. They never, ever thought they were neglected in any way. They wanted me to have that life. In a way, I don't think he wanted me to be the one that was fussing over, you know, what birthday cake they were going to have. So you've got to understand your own sense of identity, you know, and, and realise that because we have children, that doesn't mean that we need to be constructing the way of bringing those children up in the way that my mother did with five children and didn't work. You know, my mother, five kids, I thought my father was like the backbone. And when my mother died when I was 16, it was the biggest shock ever because I realized who was the backbone of that family. So we can take power in different ways as long as it's feeding our soul. And I think we have to be very honest with ourselves because actually, there's so much energy that's wasted on being up there on the crucifix and feeling guilty. Let's stick some other people up there and get down because I think, you know, if the good that you're doing is for the greater good together, you have to centre yourself back on that. Fantastic. I think we probably have time for one more question if there's anything. Ah, get at the front. Um, you're okay. the one I've just fired, so are you feeling good <laughs> after it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, basically, so please correct me if I'm wrong in any way, because I don't obviously I don't know everything. But I've heard that there's this kind of myth, if you want, that for a woman to be successful in not even just business as such, but kind of any endeavor, she has to have a partner, male or female, that's willing to kind of take the sort of you know take the kids to school, like at least if they can't afford a nanny, of course, who's willing to kind of take a step back in their career so that she can no. advance in theirs. Is that true? Thank you. you know my life. So I'm married to a woman. I've been married to a guy. So I've licked my stamps on both sides. <laughs> and um, let me tell you, no. My wife certainly doesn't take a background to me. In fact, I was like, sometimes, no, no. And I will be the greater breadwinner, but she's got her sense of self. I mean, we have to have times just like, oh my God, he's got violin on Monday. I can't do that. Are you going to do it? And then we, you know, then we work out if Fran, our manny, she decided she wanted a male nanny so that he could play football. We have the gayest male nanny who does dance routines to Mika with him. I was like, well, that was really good. I'm more butch than that playing football with him. Um, so no, I just do not believe that myth. I do believe you need a mutual symbiotic relationship of respect that both of you, whatever life, doesn't matter about what you earn, it's about you as a mutual respect to each other taking those responsibilities. And when that gets out of balance, that just doesn't feel great. But I don't, don't believe that one. I, you know, I have a friend who's in her 70s, and I'm always, I love her. She's amazing. She was an actress. And then her husband was, you know, made a lot of money, and she sort of gave up her acting, and she was like, you know. And then all the years later when he retired, she, she was my um, drama teacher, 
all the years later when he retired, she's still being the one who's running all the home and all this. And I'm like, why are you doing that? She said, because, you know, he made the money. I'm like, are you fucking serious? You looked after the children, you ran the home, you worked around, and you are still doing them. It, you can't change those people from that era that have had that. I just, I believe there is a mutual respect in relationships that doesn't matter what you're earning, you need to have a sense of self. And it can't be one pulling it all up. But I think you can do it. Like, I'm, I think my, me and my wife are completely equal and stuff. You know, she might travel, she's gone away for a week, and it's exhausting, then I'm in charge, you know, whatever. Um, so, no, that's a myth. God, I've been realising I'm swearing, and this is going up. I did the Oxford Union, and then someone said, oh, I didn't realise. Oh, I saw you on British Airways. I was like, what? They put it up. Oh, my God. I hope they edited out my effing and jeffing. It's fine. We've had much worse said in this oh, chamber. Have you? Believe me. <laughs> yeah, um, we could probably take one more question if anybody's feeling it otherwise. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Mary. I really enjoyed this, and I hope everybody did as well. So can we have a last round of applause for Mary, please? Thank you.